This joint assembly of the Mississippi Legislature is now in session. At this time, I would like to welcome to the stand a committee composed of Representatives Jennings, Flags, and Formby, and Senators Chazanall, Simmons, and Kirby to escort Governor Phil Bryant and his wife, Deborah, to the stand. Just 14 short days ago, I was sworn into office as the 64th governor of the state of Mississippi. Our team immediately went to work to properly transfer the responsibility of six executive agencies to new leadership while reappointing five others. I was more than gratified to see one of the nation's top entrepreneurs and business leaders begin his service as director of the Mississippi Development Authority. No state in the nation could claim a better economic development leader than our own Jim Barksdale. Jim. I have been fortunate to have much of the work of a long range plan for our state already completed by the Mississippi Economic Council in Blueprint, Mississippi. MEC's vision and research, along with the enthusiastic involvement of thousands of Mississippians, contributed to this effort. Their vision and goals are consistent with those of this administration. Blueprint's vision is to enable a prosperous, vibrant, and resilient Mississippi built upon a foundation of economic opportunity for all its citizens. I could not agree more. From cultivating a more robust workforce, promoting health care as an economic driver, to supporting Mississippi's creative economy, I believe the goals of Blueprint Mississippi fit perfectly with my aggressive plans for our future. I also want to thank the members of my policy summit team. The tireless work you did will help shape my agenda this year and beyond. Tonight, I will attempt to provide details of my vision for our future. Remembering a vision without action is only an illusion. So let us set a plan of action we can all see clearly. In the short time since the inaugural, we have begun to implement a plan that I believe will help grow our economy in Mississippi and put more of our people to work. As I said in my inaugural address, my first job is to make sure every Mississippian has a job. To help accomplish this goal, I will ask the legislature for a package of measures that will be known as the Mississippi Works Agenda. The first part will include a dual enrollment process that will allow students on the verge of dropping out of school to enroll in a community college workforce training program. We will, work, we will work to give these young adults a marketable skill to help them find jobs. I will ask the State Department of Education, the community colleges, and the Mississippi Department of Employment Security to come together to implement this program. We should set an, enroll, an enrollment goal and get to work so Mississippians can go to work. Additionally, to aid expansion of our new existing businesses, I will ask for the introduction of the Mississippi Small Business Regulatory Flexibility Act, which will authorize a Small Business Regulatory Review Committee. Now, their responsibility will be to review regulations in every state agency to determine first if it's a necessary function of government, and if so, is that regulation a hindrance to job creation? I believe we can modify many government rules to be more business friendly without destroying our planet or endangering lives. Last week, America saw the largest economic development project in America terminated by regulators and politicians in Washington. In Mississippi, I won't stand for job killing regulations. In addition to our existing businesses, we must continue to incentivize new businesses to come to our state. Economic development is the sun in our universe and everything else revolves around it. I will therefore, before this session is completed, ask for $31 million in bonds for economic development incentive packages. Now remember, that's less than half of what the legislature authorized last year. 
Now, other special incentives may also be requested as the need arises. I will continue to aggressively pursue new industry at home and abroad, and when we are successful, I will ask for your help to bring them to Mississippi. To enhance and grow our energy economy, we should look no further than our own Gulf of Mexico. We are proceeding on a thoughtful, steady course of offshore energy recovery in a limited area, primarily southeast of Mississippi's Barrier Islands. Now, the recovery could produce 300 and billion, 350 billion cubic feet of natural gas to help fuel America and Mississippi's economy. Just as important, it is likely to generate hundreds of millions of dollars for Americans, for Mississippi's educational trust fund. This funding is critical to our children's future, and we cannot squander it by allowing fear and rhetoric to guide our decision. We can produce jobs in our energy economy and help America become energy dependent. Independent. The cooperation of the Gulf Coast leadership and the citizens of South Mississippi understand the desperate need for energy jobs and revenue has been inspiring to me. I ask for a calm and open discussion from those who oppose this project. Now remember, Mississippi cannot afford to turn our backs to an opportunity that both Louisiana and Alabama now enjoy. We need these jobs and our school children need this revenue. And Mississippi is a leader in the energy economy, supporting and developing traditional sources of power, exploring new ways to fuel our economic growth, including tertiary oil recovery, natural gas, and biomass. From nuclear power plants to gas pipelines, our energy economy will drive Mississippi's economy and its economic growth into the 21st century. Also, I am transmitting to the legislature the Energy Sustainability and Development Act of 2012. This will create incentives for manufacturing and industrial employers to make energy efficiency upgrades that will result in significant savings, allowing them to be more competitive, retain and hire more workers, and further invest in their operations. It will also create, this act will create the Biomass Center for Excellence, which will be a partnership of public, private, and education sectors to coordinate and promote biomass research, development, and manufacturing. In addition, performance incentives for public sectors will reduce the amount of tax dollars spent on energy by our government, freeing up money better spent on infrastructure, public safety, and education. When it comes to energy innovation, my administration will lead by example. One aspect of this plan includes asking the Department of Finance and Administration to implement a pilot program for transitioning fleet automobiles to natural gas powered cars and trucks. Natural gas is clean. Hey, it is clean, more efficient, and more reliable and will save taxpayers' dollars in government's day-to-day -day operations. We can and must save valuable tax dollars and achieve new energy innovations. Of the two driving economic forces in our future, energy is one and, of course, health care is the other. As I've said many times before, we must expand our health care economy in Mississippi. To begin this process, I have proposed the creation of medical zones throughout Mississippi where a cluster of medical facilities and services exist. This will include but will not be limited to the medical corridor in Metro Jackson. Within these medical zones, we will encourage expansion by offering construction tax credits, job creation incentives where new high-tech careers begin. We must be mindful of the increasing demand for health care, realizing that collaboration of all health care providers is the only way to achieve success. We must heal together, research together, and find better ways to serve our citizens together. 
To achieve this goal, I have asked the Mississippi Economic Council to conduct a study to find how we can build greater economic development opportunities in healthcare. Now, this is not an academic study, but an action plan for the future of healthcare development all across our state. I have asked the nationally recognized researcher during the, doing the work for 10 recommendations to move our healthcare industry forward. This will be an effort unlike anything in the nation. A comprehensive action plan to provide health care as an industry of necessity. I look forward to sharing the progress of this review with all of you before the end of this session. <clears throat> to encourage the placement of doctors in medically underserved areas of this state, I will ask the legislature to also consider capping the state income tax of every new physician in these underserved communities. Now this will allow doctors to serve in rural areas of our state while maintaining the necessary income to support his or her family and small medical business. The added health care services also reduce the cost of Medicaid by improving the health of recipients. By focusing on the increasing need of acute health care, we can improve the health of our bodies and the health of our economy. For we know that each doctor creates an economic impact of approximately $2 million for his or her community. As citizens, we must do a better job with our individual health care. Every Mississippian should realize that a sound diet and exercise program will save lives and reduce health care costs. We should not be the most obese state in the nation, leading the worst statistics of heart attacks and strokes. Mississippians walk, run, go to the gym, plant a garden, or ride a bike. Getting active is the key to your own health care. And I, again, intend to lead by example. Each year, I hope you will join me on a 5K run starting at the governor's mansion. I look forward to seeing you this summer for our first 5K Governor's Run for Health. Thank you. Increasing the educational achievements of Mississippi is critical to developing our future workforce. To help in this effort, I will offer an executive budget recommendation that will level fund MAEP and will also seek to replace funding for high growth areas and fully fund the National Board Certified Teacher Program. We must do all we can, even during these challenging times, to keep our best teachers in the classroom. Additionally, we must make sure our teachers graduate from college prepared to teach. Just now, Dr. Hank Bounds and Dr. Tom Burnham are working to increase minimum entrance standards for teacher training programs at our universities. We must have the best and brightest students in our university classrooms to become the best teachers in our schools. The Mississippi Department of Education pilot program is also being completed in seven districts and 10 schools to quantify the characteristics of a quality teacher. As a former teacher, I know how rewarding this profession can be when your students achieve. Once we have the data from this program, I will recommend a pay for performance program for our teachers based on student attainments and not on subjective evaluations. It is time it is time we started paying for quality, not longevity. I've always believed the responsibility for a child's earliest learning belongs to the parents. I do realize in today's society, many of our children are in taxpayer-funded daycare centers. Head Start and other federal programs provide Mississippi more than $241 million annually for child care programs. 
Now, I would suggest that we collaborate our efforts in early childhood learning by monitoring the learning opportunities in licensed child care centers to include more than just the size of the room or the number of bathrooms or health issues alone. Those are important. Currently, the Department of Health receives funding from the Department of Human Services for inspection and monitoring of licensed child care centers. Now, if we combine their functions into a division of early childhood learning under the Department of Human Services, we could streamline services and improve our ability to identify the quality programs for early childhood learning. Now, this can be done with enabling legislation at no cost. The funding now can be transferred from the Department of Human Services that is being transferred from the Department of Human Services to state health will simply be retained or shared. In the next year, we will gather information from ongoing programs such as Building Blocks, Excel by Five, Allies for Quality, child, Quality Child Care Protection, and the Quality Rating System that will give us the metrics we need to determine the best practices for early childhood learning. Now, reading must be at the forefront of our educational plan. <laughs> Statistics tell us that Mississippi children confront a wide range of obstacles during their primary education. I know this challenge firsthand. As a child, I struggled with dyslexia and believed I was a failure until the fourth grade. I then had a wonderful teacher, Mrs. Henley, explained to me that I simply did not see the letters on the page like other children. I had to practice my reading and work hard to keep up, but I had a desire to succeed. I did what was expected of me and soon began to see the wor world of the written word, and in doing so, learned to love reading. Thanks to the love of that wonderful teacher and the support of my parents, I have obtained three college degrees, have served as a professor of American government, and have been honored with a successful career in public service. Reading is personal for me, and I want every child in Mississippi to have that same opportunity. Now, the solution to these problems are complex and challenging. It would be easy to ask every parent to make certain their child has a proper eye exam. That should be done. But identifying and managing the complications of dyslexia is something we must confront. I would encourage teachers and parents who believe a child is dyslexic to seek assistance from the Mississippi Dyslexia Program at the Department of Education. Awareness of this learning disability can often help a teacher and a parent understand their child's difficulty in reading and spelling. As governor, I will work to improve our response to this challenge to success. I am a proponent of Teach for America and the Mississippi Teachers Corps, two programs that bring bright and energetic young leaders from many different disciplines to teach in our most challenging schools. I will ask the legislature to accept my EBR, my executive budget recommendation, by placing $12 million towards funding these necessary programs. Now, keeping the best teachers in the classroom must be our priority. Now, local districts will add a portion of the appropriation to keep these quality teachers at work. This is another major recommendation from Blueprint Mississippi that I believe has real merit and is obtainable. I will also ask the legislature to pass the Education Administration Consolidation Bill. That will mandate that non-educational duties of school districts be consolidated to one central county office by 2014. That means centralized human resources directors, centralized purchasing, centralized transportation, and other duties that can be consolidated without disturbing one single student or teacher. 
In the 1980s, Mississippi passed the unit system law for county administrative duties. It took the old county beat system and consolidated them into one central unit. Elected officials retained their duties while county governments became more efficient. Let us take that model to our school districts. I want education dollars spent in the classroom and not just offices. <laughs> Finally, I ask and I fully expect the legislature will pass a workable charter school act once and for all. As all of you know, I have asked for the passage of the Smart Budget Act. Now this act, act has passed the Senate by super majorities for the last two years and has died in the House of Representatives. With new visionary leadership, I am hopeful we will pass this act and start budgeting on performance, not politics. The defenders of the status quo have controlled the budget process for far too long. It is time for bold leadership to bring the budget process into the 21st century. I ask to put the Smart Budget Act on my desk this session. This will show voters who sent us here that we deserve their confidence. And when dealing with their money, we will lead. Currently in Mississippi, there are more than 150 boards and commissions. Now these were often created when we could not make a decision on a difficult subject or appointed a committee to study the problem. Now good people serve on these committees and boards, but the purpose of many have been exhausted and their existence should be reviewed. Now tonight I'm asking Secretary of State Delbert Hoseman, who has the statutory authority to record each appointment, to review the necessity of these boards and commissions and offer recommendations to the executive and legislative branches on possible termination or at least consolidation of some of the boards and some of our commissions. Any final decision would obviously rest with the legislature, but I trust Secretary Hoseman to help vet these recommendations before we take action. Another issue that must be boldly confronted is the epidemic of teen pregnancy and deadbeat dads. Without hesitation, we must begin the discussion of how to reduce teen pregnancy in Mississippi. As you know, we lead the nation in teen pregnancy and consequently low birth weights and high infant mortality rates. We know a child born to a teen mother almost always has a difficult path to success. We must change the dynamic of this reality beginning with the most obvious offender, the adult male. Any adult? Any adult male who fathers a child with a teenage mother under the age of consent should be sought out and prosecuted as a sexual predator. Every father should know the taxpayers are not responsible for his children. We must continue to use every means possible to successfully collect and distribute child support payments. If you father a child in Mississippi, you will pay for your child. I would hope the Mississippi legislature will pass and send to my desk the Child Protection Act. This will be the first step in identifying the predators who take underage girls to an abortion clinic to hide their crimes. I ask you to send that bill to me and I will gladly sign it into law to keep our children safe. <laughs> Additionally, I have asked the Director of the Department of Human Services and the State Health Officer to provide me within 30 days an aggressive plan to address our teen pregnancy rate and suggestions on how to curb it. We can no longer pretend that teen pregnancy and illegitimacy are non-issues. We must boldly confront the facts and address them. Now, during this very busy month, I will also release my executive budget recommendation to the legislature. 
My EBR will include setting aside 2% of our revenue to replenish the state's rainy day fund. As Lieutenant Governor, I fought to fully fund our cash reserves and to prevent its depletion. I am proud to say we maintain some $281 million in funds today that can be used to help balance our budget while delivering necessary services to the taxpayers of this state. I am fortunate to have physical conservatives in our legislative leadership who will help control our spending, set aside some revenue for the future, and continue the reduction of spending one-time money for reoccurring expenses. If we do our job, Mississippi will maintain a savings and be prepared for the challenges of a turbulent global economy. Now please rest assured, I also have not abandoned my hope of making Mississippi abortion free. I continue to believe that every life begins at conception and every child should have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I strongly believe that we are a nation of laws rather than of men and that people who illegally cross our borders, violating our federal laws, cannot be ignored. It is, it is not only the state's right, but responsibility to determine if these violators are among our general population, particularly when they violate the criminal statutes of Mississippi. I'm also excited to announce the overhaul of Mississippi's official website. Mississippi.gov. The site serves as a gateway to an array of official partner sites, including 135 online services and 139 websites. The primary mission of MS.gov is to provide enhanced government information and, services deli and service delivery to Mississippi residents, visitors, and bus businesses. But just if not more important, citizens can go online to see government expenditures and determine exactly where their money is being spent. <laughs> January is a month of renewal and reflection. Each year we begin anew, striving to better ourselves and to realize those goals we were unable or unwilling to achieve in the proceeding year. In Mississippi government, every 4th January is a time of special renewal when new legislators and state officers begin their term. In my lifetime, there has never been such an historic change as we are witnessing in our state government. In the few weeks since January began, Mississippi welcomed a new lieutenant governor, a speaker of the house, and inaugurated a new governor. For the first time in generations, all three share a common conservative philosophy about how best to move our state forward. As the scriptures remind us, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die a time to plan and a time to uproot, a time to tear down and a time to rebuild. My friends, now is the time to build together. We have endured many challenges in our history and we have endured them with grace and strength. These challenges have tempered us for the opportunities that lay ahead. I call on every Mississippi, and no matter what race, region, or party, to rise above our petty differences and build together the Mississippi our citizens deserve. Let us go forward from this time and place, unafraid to make the bold changes that will help us rise together. May God bless each of you the state we all love, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you.